Hey there, this is Ari Witten. Welcome back to the Energy Blueprint Podcast. I am very, very excited for today's episode. I've wanted to do this for a very long time. I've had lots of people actually asking me to do this for a very long time. And I've, I'm excited to welcome Dr. Paul Saladino uh, to the show for what is a discussion, debate. There's going to be some points of agreement, some points of disagreement with also Alex Leaf who has been on the show two or three times previously. And I'll give you their brief bios. Dr. Saladino is a medical doctor. He's the author of The Carnivore Code, Unlocking the Secrets to Optimal Health by Returning to Our Ancestral Diet. He's regarded as a leading authority on the science and applic application of the carnivore diet. And prior to medical school, he worked as a physician assistant in cardiology. He attended medical school at the University of Arizona, focusing on integrative medicine and nutritional biochemistry. And he completed his residency in psychiatry at the University of Washington. And Alex is, you guys have heard, lots and lots of content from him. He's a certified sports nutritionist. He's a, nutritioner, a nutrition researcher, and he has a master's of science in nutrition. So welcome to the show, guys. Thank you so much for doing this. Um, I know that it's often like kind of an anxiety provoking thing to have these kinds of discussions and debates. Uh, so thank you for having the, the courage to do this. And um, I hope that we can all keep it polite and respectful and, you know, no, no mudslinging or anything like that. I'm sure you guys are cool with that. And, and mm -hmm. I probably don't even have to tell you, but I thought I'd mention it anyway. And the other thing that I want to mention just before we get into it is just to try to be respectful of the other person talking and try to wait for them to complete their train of thoughts before jumping in. I've listened to a, a number of debates, especially the kind of vegan carnivore debates with very various people or vegan omnivore debates uh, where there's a lot of interruptions and a lot of mudslinging, and I'm hoping we can avoid that. Um, I also want to preface this by saying this is going to be an unusual discussion compared to a lot of the, the debate, type, vegan type debates that have been out there previously, because they're often focused on whether meat is harmful or not harmful. And so you kind of have the vegan, um, vegan versus carnivore who, you know, the carnivores are saying meat is great, plants are bad. The vegan is saying plants are good, meat is bad, and there's very little room for any kind of overlap or, or you know, consensual reality that's being shared. Um, and I think there in, in this podcast, there's going to be a lot of territory that is shared and agreed upon. And we're going to focus on some specific areas that are not necessarily in agreement. So I, I'm hoping that it'll be a great discussion. And welcome to the show, guys. Thank you again for doing this. Yeah. Thanks for hosting it. Yeah. Cool. So let's get started, I think, by just sort of stating what you what what you think are the main nutritional contributors to disease in the Western world. Like what what do you think are the factors in the diet that are actually contributing to the high rates of disease? I think you guys both agree that there clearly are components of the diet that are major contributors to things like cardiovascular disease and neurological disease and cancer, diabetes and obesity. So I would like you each to state what you think those factors are. So uh, Paul, would you like to go first? Sure. Um, I think that the two biggest factors in the diet are probably processed sugars and seed oils. Seed oils being corn, canola, safflower, sunflower, soybean, grapeseed, etc. Those would probably be the two biggest in my opinion. Okay, that was fast. Alex? I, I would argue that the primary driver of disease in the population is a diet that's based around ultra processed, hyper palatable foods. So combinations of refined grains, added fats, added sugars, salt, flavoring, basically, you know, everything that's delicious. I think that promotes the passive overconsumption of calories, which leads to gradual weight gain, especially over the holiday seasons when people tend to eat more food. And over time, it's just like this giant cluster of sugar and fat and energy poisoning, so to speak, that drives the disease. 
Excellent. Okay, so um, let's point out the obvious. Neither of you claimed that meat is a primary driver of disease. Uh, okay, so I assume this is an area of agreement from both of you. That well, what, I, I would like to just stay real quick. I think that if the entire, like, let's just use the U.S. as an example. If the entire U.S. population went on a carnivorous diet, I think that there would be a net health benefit. I think the health of most people would improve from things like reduced energy intake, increased protein intake. Uh, there might be some nutrient deficiencies if they aren't like, because a lot of them get nutrients from the fortified refined foods they're eating. But that could be circumvented if you like give a multivitamin just for the sake of argument. If you give a multivitamin to everyone and have them go on a carnivorous diet, I think nutrient deficiencies would be avoided and most people would improve their health. Okay. Well, let's get, let's get back to that later. We'll, we'll come back to that. So what, what do you both consider to be the most healthful diet? Like what are, let's clarify positions before we get into any points of, of debate or, or disagreement. What do you think is the optimal diet? Um, Paul, you wrote a book saying, uh, the unlocking the secrets to optimal health by returning to our ancestral diet. What, what does that ancestral diet look like? And then Alex, I'd like you to answer the same question. What do you think is the optimal diet for humans? So I think that it's going to be somewhat individual and there is some nuance here. I generally feel that there are many lines of evidence, paleoanthropological, biochemical, medical, nutrition, suggesting that animal organs and meat and fat are quite nutrient dense, uh, contain a variety of unique nutrients uh, that are you widely health promoting and um, should be at the center of a, uh, a health promoting optimal human diet. I think that the majority of people can add some degree of plant foods to that uh, based on their individual genetic makeup, probably their uh, pre-existing conditions, the context that we're working with in every individual. And I think that those plant foods might be considered on a spectrum of toxicity, uh, that not all plant foods appear to be uh, totally benign or health promoting for all individuals, but that some individuals can eat a variety of plant foods without any apparent negative health consequences. And I think that um, there is some, there's a significant benefit from considering if given that seed oils, refined sugars, hyperpalatable processed foods have been eliminated from the diet and meat and organs are made the, the centerpiece of the human diet, I think there is a benefit to considering plants on a spectrum of toxicity and depending on an individual's health goals, health existing, pre-existing health conditions, um, often the elimination of some plant foods can be beneficial for people who are not thriving. Okay, let me, before Alex, let me just mm -hmm. stop for a moment. So, uh, Paul, I think what you just said is perfectly reasonable. I don't think anybody would, would disagree with you or maybe vegans might disagree with some of that. Um, but I would like you to like, I guess, quantify how much of the diet you think should be focused on animal foods versus plant foods. Like, cause uh, for example, I was listening this morning to, to one of your, your videos, I think just from a few months ago, um, in maybe December, 2020. And it's it, the, the feel of it was almost arguing that almost every type of plant food other than fruits and, uh, squashes were more toxic, were more harmful than healthful. And like you generally are recommending avoiding most kinds of plant foods. Is that accurate to say, or, or would you clarify that? Uh, well, I would clarify that like I did. Um, okay. that, so you asked me a, a number of questions in that statement. Uh, okay. You asked me what proportion of animal foods I think uh, would be ideal for a human. And I'm not sure whether you're asking in terms of calories or, or you, weight. You can, answer, you can answer however you like. Yeah, I think that generally speaking, um, it's it's a little hard to quantify between an individu individuals. I think that um, for some people, perhaps, and again, this is going to depend on macronutrient ratios, perhaps 50 to 60% of the calories coming from animal foods is a good place to start. But again, 
that depends on macronutrient ratios. If they're eating a higher fat uh, animal-based diet, then they may have more calories coming from animal foods and less coming from carbohydrates. But I think that humans can thrive with a variety of macronutrient ratios. And I don't really um, subscribe to a system of belief that is focused on any particular macronutrient, uh, you know, macronutrient set of, you know, ratios. And I think that like we're going to talk about in this podcast, the constraints are around adequate nutrient consumption. And if you can get the vitamins and minerals, and I think now we're beginning to understand that there are bioactive peptides that are valuable for humans as well, uh, that your body needs. And I think that if you can get them in a bioavailable source from a bioavailable source and you can absorb them well, then there are, um, there are a few, there are degrees of flexibility to those ratios. So, um, yeah, I think that, uh, it's not necessarily helpful to to try and and create rigid dogma around that. Um, okay, I, just um, more point of clarification: since the the title of your book is the carnivore code, you're you're not defending a position that where you're saying the carnivore diet and all meat, you know, basically no plant diet is the optimal diet for humans. No, I'm not, and I've never I've never said that. Are you okay. pigeonholing me, Ari? Because we discussed uh, no, that I'm, that I'm, would not go well. <laughs> No, no, I, I, I interject real quick. Before, uh, before we get Paul. into things, hold on, Alex. Before yeah. we get into things, I, I want to make sure I'm allowing you guys to clarify what your positions are. Yeah, um, I don't and, think anybody that follows I'm, I'm me. Not, I'm not projecting anything on you that isn't a position that you hold. So I appreciate um, that. Okay. Uh, Alex, would you real like quick, to- Paul, would it be fair to say that you wrote the book as a means of trying to make a carnivore diet? as ideal as it could be if someone chose to follow it, but that you you personally don't believe that being completely carnivore is necessary for good health? Uh, yeah, I think that's a reasonable statement. I think that there were a number of reasons for writing the book. Have either of you guys read the book? I personally I've, haven't. I've listened to a bunch of podcasts and debates that you've had in a bunch of your content, but I haven't read your book. So neither of you I know read that the book. It, it's unique in that it... Uh, promotes a heavy intake of organ meats and foods that contain nutrients commonly believed to not be provided in sufficient quantities without plants. And you, my understanding is that you basically outline how to create a nutrient dense carnivorous diet. Again, if someone were to choose to follow it, you're saying this is probably the best way to do that. But doing something like that is, you know, isn't the same as saying this is what needs to happen period. You're just saying this is where I recommend you begin if you choose to go down that dietary path. I would say that's an accurate statement. So the the book begins with a consideration of human history and human trophic levels and paleoanthropology, moves into a discussion of different types of plant toxins that could be harmful for some people based on their individual genetics and perhaps uh, current status in terms of the health journey. And then it uh, goes on to debunk many of the myths that are common surrounding the harms of meat. And then at the end of the book, I have some discussion about different incarnations of a, quote, carnivore or animal-based diet, some of which include plants. So, um, yeah, so there is discussion of a plant toxicity spectrum in the book. And I think that the book is more than simply, um, if you want to do a carnivore diet, this is the best way to do it. It's a consideration of um, it's an exoneration of meat and a consideration of plants on a toxicity spectrum. And um, okay. yeah, so that, that's what I'm doing in the book. And I think that that kind of moves us in the direction of animal-based because within the general sphere of uh, nutritional media, I think that there is a, a, a push against both of those things. There is a, a general push toward uh, the, the idea that, that meat is harmful for humans or bad for the environment. And in, at the end of the book, I discuss regenerative agriculture and the way that raising animals properly could be quite good for the environment and soil health long term. And in fact, might be one of the only ways that humans will continue on the planet uh, long term. And also within the book, I outline kind of this idea that I think that for humans, uh, for many humans, optimal health will uh, be achieved if they think about where their nutrients are coming from, include more organs in their diet, uh, include well-raised meat in their diet and consider plants on a spectrum of toxicity and 
appreciate the fact that if someone is reading the book and is not thriving, is not achieving the health goals that they want, that perhaps there is more to the conversation around plants than is discussed in the mainstream nutritional sphere, which is from what I will tell, from what I've observed at a broad level, that all plants are good, the more plants you eat, the better, and um, that if you're not thriving, it's because you're not eating enough plants. So the book was meant to be a, a counterpoint to that and an examination of a different way of considering sort of the nutritional landscape. Does that make sense? Does that answer your question? I think you asked yeah. a couple different questions, Ari. Yeah. Alex, do you, do you want to say anything in, in response? I think that's a good... You guys largely agree on this, right? Yeah, well, I think that's a good segue into what most of our discussion in this podcast will be focused on, which isn't the meat side of things, but the plant. Yeah. So, well, <clears> I think... Before, before we get there, Alex... I'll, well, I'll I was going to say what mine is. <laughs> okay, all right, go ahead. Yeah, I was going to say that, you know, I think an omnivorous diet is the healthiest diet for a human. I think that when you look at anthropological, paleolithic, and that type of evidence, I think that humans went through stages of being both herbivorous as well as primarily carnivorous, uh, with the carnivore aspect happening around two million years ago, around the times of Homo erectus, as we started to evolve into Homo sapien. And there was a large sustenance on large, like, megafauna, you know, like, uh, quote, you know, woolly mammoths, so to speak. And they supplied a lot of readily digestible energy, especially with the advents of fire and making food more digestible. There were specific nutrients like DHA that they provided that allowed our grain, our ugh, brains to expand in size. But then there was a time, maybe some like 100,000 years ago, where we started to incorporate more and more plant foods into our diet, and we kind of settled in where we're at now, which is, you know, having more omnivorous anatomy. We have things that are both like shorter, small intestines, or sorry, shorter, uh, large intestines and colons compared to herbivores, yet we still maintain things like molars. Um, for the uh, destruction of plant leaves, that types of things. Um, we have amylase, which has been one of the like most prolific uh, population level uh, gene expansions that we've had where people develop multiple copies because it was, it was so beneficial to, our, uh, to what we were eating and making the most of it. So I think the ideal diet's omnivorous. And I think there's a lot of variation in terms of how much of that comes from animal products and plants. But ultimately, I do think that a significant portion of the diet should come from plant foods in order for it to be uh, as healthy as it could possibly be. And that's basically my position. I think that a lot of uh, beliefs around toxicity of plants, I think that they have credibility within certain niche populations like people with inflammatory bowel diseases and the things of that nature, but ultimately I think that a lot of the claims around anti-nutrients just are, don't hold up to scrutiny. And I believe plants are nutrient dense sources of not just vitamins and minerals, but phytochemicals that have been shown to benefit our health above and beyond essential nutrient requirements. Okay. So just to clarify, neither of you obviously thinks that meat is intrinsically harmful clearly paul you you don't believe that since you think meat should be a, a you know very central to the diet alex you also don't think meat is intrinsically harmful and you think a, in a, a fairly large um, I, correct me if my phrasing is wrong but a fairly large amount of animal food consumption is perfectly compatible with with human health yeah yeah and i think a lot of the harms of animal foods can actually be circumvented by a high intake of plant foods Okay, so I, I want to just point out, since we don't have a vegan on here arguing the vegan sort of anti-meat perspective, but, um, you know, there's been various hypotheses put forth by that community and some research to support various lines of this. Uh, for example, that uh, meat raises mTOR levels and mTOR is, you know, oncogenic, promotes cancer or IGF-1 levels or the byproducts of cooking meat. Uh, heterocyclic amines and things like that, or the compound in beef, new 5GC, or the TMAO hypothesis, or, you know, saturated fat and cholesterol clogging arteries, all these kinds of arguments about why animal food consumption is 
harmful. And since we don't have a vegan on here, can can each of you just kind of make a brief statement on why you think none of those things hold water or why you think the evidence overall indicates that animal foods are either healthful or compatible with good health? Um, can I can I comment on just can I just respond to what Alex said before we do that, Ari? Sure. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So I, I just want to be clear that I've not. Um, uh, I'm not taking a position that humans are not omnivorous. Uh, I think that omnivory is something that's widely misunderstood and that if you look at omnivores, um, the majority of omnivores specialize. They either focus the majority of their diet on animal foods or on plant foods. So over 70% of omnivores make more than you know 80% of their diet or 70 to 80% of their diet, either plant or animal foods. So there are sort of plant-leaning omnivores and animal-leaning omnivores within the zoological collection of species on the planet. And I think that my position uh, is that humans are probably or appear to be an animal-leaning omnivore. And I base that position on uh, unique nutrients in animal foods, uh, increased bioavailability of nutrients in animal foods, and uh, paleoanthropology, our focus on animal foods originally, which probably had very unique effects on the growth of the brain and made us sort of who we are as humans today, as homo sapiens. So uh, I think that that's just a position I wanted to clarify. Interestingly, mm -hmm. there, there appear to have been more herbivorous or plant-leaning species of hominids, like Paranthropus bozii, that went extinct. So around the time of Homo mm -hmm. erectus and Homo habilis, there, uh, there is evidence of, uh, from uh, stable isotope studies that there was a species that leaned more toward plants in terms of its, in the sake of, from the perspective of its omnivorous uh, you know, uh, physiology, and that species went extinct. So that's quite interesting. And I completely agree that there, there is evidence that 85,000, 100,000 years ago, we did swing more toward uh, plants. Not, I don't think we swung to be herbivorous omnivores, but we started eating more plants in some uh, studies, probably due to the lack of megafauna or mm -hmm. some would hypothesize that there was a megafaunal extinction. So from that, I've kind of suggested the hypothesis that if we look at, and I think Alex and I may disagree on this, if we look at the relative value of animals and plants in the human diet, I sort of see animals as superior to plants and animals as the, the central piece of the human diet and that when humans can't get animals, they may rely on plants more as, quote, survival foods or as a, quote, fallback food. Um, so I think that that'll be an interesting point of the conversation, whether plants are, uh, in fact, fallback foods or whether they serve a unique role as a central part of the human diet. But that's my position on plants, that, okay. that generally animal foods have been consistently sought as the primary food for humans and that we do have omnivorous physiology. We can eat plants and not die. Um, and we have retained some features of, of uh, that work that are found in our, our herbivorous ancestors and primates, chimps and bonobos. But as Alex was suggesting, there are also many adaptations to meat eating, a uh, very small, large intestine relative to primates, a longer, small intestine than our acidic stomach. Uh, there's all kinds of things. The way we handle uh, fatty acids, um, insulin resistance as a response to starvation, uh, there's so many adaptations that really are focused on on meat eating for humans. So I just wanted to add that kind of that perspective. And sure. your question, Ari, was about all of these vegan arguments about the negative compounds in, in meat. Yeah, yeah, I mean, that's 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 a little bit more complex than a short uh, 45 well, second I, sound bite. I don't, I don't mean for you to systematically go through the evidence on each of them, but what I mean is what, what do you feel is the most compelling evidence that has convinced you that meat is compatible with good health or is su actively supportive of good health? 2.5 million years of hominid evolution with clear evidence for a preference for meat eating and, you know, uh, there's anthropologic evidence and ethnographic evidence of hunter-gatherer tribes that eat a lot of meat and are very healthy. And so there's, there, and then you can look at the medical literature and if you want to go into each of those pieces, you can really make strong arguments that start to expose the, uh, 
uh, the fragility of those arguments, whether it's TMAO or new 5GC or mm -hmm. heterocyclic amines. I mean, there's, there's a large amount of evidence to suggest that those are all very uh, difficult to defend positions based on the majority of medical literature, and that makes sense evolutionarily and anthropologically. Okay. Alex, do you want to give your thoughts on kind of the, the, the vegan takes on, on meat and why you think they're flawed? Yeah, I would say that it's, uh, it just comes down to logical consistency. Um, and a lot of the same arguments could be made against the vegan diet. I mean, let's say someone ate a diet of 100% white bread, right? That's a vegan diet, and it's obviously not healthy. Well, the same could be done with meat, you know? It really depends on the type of meat you're eating, how it's processed. Like, if someone's going to eat the fattiest steak they can, charbroiled over an open flame until it's, like, black all the way through, and then eat that, like, you're getting a lot of harmful toxic chemicals that are produced. But if you do things like the Maasai, right, who have a meat and milk heavy diet, they won't even eat meat unless they coat it in some like 230 different herbs. And that's probably, you know, they have an evolutionary uh, learning where they realize they had less disease when they did that because we know that doing things like cooking meat when it's coated in herbs and oils and that stuff helps reduce the formation of these chemicals with saturated fat. Not all meat is high in saturated fat. And similarly, you could eat a diet of a bunch of coconut and you could have a super high saturated fat vegan diet. It's not really a good argument against meat because meat isn't just one homogenous group of things, just like plants aren't. You know, there's a lot of subdivisions. So I think this type of logic could be applied to most of the arguments made, TMAO. Yeah, you make it from things like carnitine in your gut, but you also get a ton of it preformed from seafood, which is consistently associated with good health outcomes in the literature. You know, why, like, I just think there's a lot of nuance and logical inconsistencies. Okay. So what, what is the evidence specifically that high, higher levels of meat consumption compared to, let's say, a vegetarian or vegan diet is compatible with just as long of a life and as low of disease rates. Paul, I know you talk a lot about the epidemiological research, healthy user bias. Um, can you talk about some of those studies, like the epidemiological studies that have controlled for, for the healthy user bias in a good way and you know, kind of the vegan versus omnivore studies and why you think being omnivorous and including animal foods in, in the diet is no more unhealthful than a, ve a purely plant-based vegan approach. Uh, can I just mention something that Alex said? Alex, have you visited the Maasai? No, I haven't visited any of the uh, people. I've, I've just, it, all of my stuff comes from uh, literature that's been published on them. Yeah, when I visited the Hadza and the Maasai, I found um, <clears throat> considerations of, or, you know, much of the literature that I'd read about fiber consumption to be false or different than what I observed. And certainly when I was with Maasai, I didn't observe them coating it in, in any collection of herbs. The Hadza definitely do not do that. They just throw the baboon on the fire and then we eat it. So the Hadza are doing nothing to uh, mitigate any of the uh, compounds formed in an open fire. But I'll tell you that the meat that I ate with the Hadza was not charred. It was, it was cooked quickly on a fire and we ate mm -hmm. the whole baboon but there was no consideration of herbs and they weren't going to stop and gather yeah. herbs and put it on the meat. So, so, and, and I, nor did I observe that with the Maasai. So, okay. and, and, you know, um, certainly also the Hadza do not, did not eat a high fiber diet, uh, for the week that I was with them, um, that some may, may argue in response that, that I did not spend enough time with them. And believe me, yeah, I would I, love to spend multiple I, years with the Hadza but um, they, they did not eat a high fiber diet when I was with them either. So many of these conceptualizations of what these groups do, um, at least a few of them, I have found to be inconsistent when, when I've gone there in person. Um, and your other question, Ari, was about, um, what was it about? <laughs> so I, w I would love for you to talk about the healthy user bias and sure. the epidemiological research more broadly and why you feel some of the epidemiological research that has controlled for those confounding variables in the sort of vegan versus omnivore studies have definitively shown that animal food consumption, omnivory, is, 
is no less healthy than veganism. Well, there's there's no there's nothing definitive about observational research in general. So I will um, you must remove that word. Um, but there's a pretty clear signal in the research that when you control, if you compare, for instance, like the UK shoppers study is a great study. If you look at the overall death rates of vegans versus omnivores, vegans have a lower death rate. But if you then control in the omnivory group for those who have healthy behaviors, which I think starts to get at the healthy user bias, or at least the unhealthy user bias, um, you see that the death rates are exactly the same. And so uh, the, the assertion or the, the, the inference or the, you know, the hypothesis that you could draw from that is that the benefits of a vegan diet are, that we see in observational epidemiology are unlikely to be linked to the absence of meat in the human diet and more likely to be linked to many of the companion behaviors that come along with that sort of a food choice. Most listening to this will understand that in the West, we've had a, a paradigm or at least a, uh, a set of information coming from nutritional authorities for 70 years since Ansel Keys that meat is harmful to humans. And so there is an association in, in our behaviors uh, of those who shun meat or eat less meat and those who do more, quote, healthy behaviors like being in the sun, exercising, getting colonoscopies and mammograms, and they tend to be of a higher socioeconomic status. So this is what we call sort of the healthy user bias, that, that there is an association there, and that comes up repeatedly in studies that are done in the West. Now, intriguingly, when we do studies that are observational epidemiology in the East, across Thailand, Singapore, China, uh, other countries, we don't see the same thing, and we see a very different trend. And so in my discussions with plant-based advocates who love to rely heavily on um, observational epidemiology because that is one of the only positions that they can take. Um, they, they really don't have much answer for the, the counterpoint that if you look at these large studies done in Asia with 200,000 to 300,000 people over four to eight years, you find a very different association. You find that the men who eat the most meat have the lowest rates of heart disease and the women who eat the most, who eat the most meat have the lowest rates of cancer. And so when we see these sort of conflicts, we have to ask ourselves questions about whether this epidemiology, this correlation is actually telling us what we think it's telling us. And that's why it's so misleading. You'll never see this reported in the mainstream media in the West. But if you, if you dig into it, there's, there's quite a lot of um, inconsistency here that needs to be examined. And again, the overarching framework for this is that observational epidemiology is a very, uh, in my opinion, that's a very, uh, a very poor thing to base your nutritional decisions on. Uh, yeah. I think it's a very shaky set of data to make decisions about about human health on because of these confounding um, biases, healthy user bias and then unhealthy user bias. Okay. And unhealthy user bias is the opposite of healthy user bias. If you think about the paradigm or the narrative for the last 70 years, those who have those who have eaten meat are generally the people who are rebellious and are saying, you know, and I'm going to ride my motorcycle and smoke my cigarettes and drink my alcohol and eat my hamburger at McDonald's with a bun, with, you know, with seed oils, drenched fries, with a milkshake, hyper palatable processed foods. So these are the key concepts, I think, that lead to a lot of misunderstanding around this observational research. And I've said in my social media or asked the question, you know, how often do you see someone go to McDonald's and just order hamburger patties? Or how often do you go to a barbecue in the Midwest of the United States and see people just eat steak without a brownie, a beer, hyper palatable processed food with processed sugar and seed oils. And so these are the correlations or these are the associations um, that, that's, that observational epidemiology cannot distinguish between. Okay. And just for me to add one point before you jump in here, Alex, in listening to the conversation with, uh, with Dr. Furman, basically this was the crux of your disagreement is, uh, is, is Joel Furman was basically saying, here's all these thousands of epidemiological studies that clearly show that more meat consumption is harmful and higher plant food consumption, fruits and vegetable consumption, nuts and seed consumption, beans and so on are healthful. And you, you were basically saying, I think all of that research for the most part is nonsense, is garbage, and we should not be looking to that as the gold standard. And so there was basically an impasse as far as your ability to agree on what type of science we should even be looking at to determine how we should eat. 
I believe he was. I believe that uh, that I drew an analogy to a landfill um, right. with that research, saying that if the research is low quality, um, that that you can stack more and more low quality research upon itself. That doesn't increase the quality of the research. Um, I think that I would uh, bristle at anyone. You know, I don't think that it's completely garbage. We can draw, there's an association there from which we can draw a hypothesis, which needs to be tested. Yeah. But um, uh, that it's, it's low quality. Okay. It's low quality research that we should not base decisions on, especially when we have interventional research with red meat that suggests the opposite. When we have human evolution, which is clearly a path taken with a lot of meat and organ consumption. And when we have conflicting epidemiology done in places with a different narrative surrounding it. So that was my general discussion with Joel Furman. On that podcast, he, he claimed that there were interventional studies with red meat, unprocessed red meat showing harm in humans. He's failed to provide any of those. Uh, in response to me, he just sent an email with six more epidemiology studies. Okay. <laughs> he just doesn't quite understand that it's very difficult to control uh, for these biases in, in research. And we should be looking at interventional research as the gold standard. Okay, Alex, I want you to jump in with your thoughts on all this. I wanna just interject one more point, which is the hierarchy of scientific evidence. Um, and just to help listeners understand that there is kind of, there are levels of evidence that are considered stronger or weaker evidence. And I think it's accurate to say what Paul just said around epidemiological evidence being used to formulate hypotheses, which need to be tested in, in more controlled experimental studies. One of the challenges, as I see it from my perspective, is I do think there's some legitimacy to, to Joel Furman's claim that there is value to long-term research to see how things actually play out in the end as far as mortality outcomes. And it's really hard to do that in the context of a randomized controlled stop trial. Um, anything that lasts more than like a few years tends to cost many millions or tens of millions of dollars to do. And it's just very rare to see any kind of really long term interventional study. Um, so I think there's a bit there's a bit of a challenge just around like how we value different types of science on this and kind of which one we consider to be strong or weak evidence. But Alex, I know you know a lot about this topic as well, so I'll let you jump in here. Can I respond okay. to that, Ari? Sure, please. Yeah, go for it. I mean, I would just say that, that there's plenty of long-term evidence in Asia that shows that meat is associated with better outcomes. So I don't know how Joel ignore those. Yeah, well, I, those. I think the argument that I've seen, like, for example, from David Katz on that subject, I read a bit about that, is poverty is a huge factor that influences those epidemiological studies. So the people who eat less meat in those cultures generally are poor and generally eat like mostly white rice. So that, that was the argument that I've seen David Katz make on that subject. So he's but, talking about bias. He's talking about inherent bias, like, which is exactly what we find in the United States. I mean, so financial... there's, there's, a, there's a healthy user bias factor, as you explained earlier, but then there's also this, especially in, I think, the poorer Asian countries, there's, there's a poverty socioeconomic factor that plays into the, the results of those epidemiological studies as well. Of course. And so basically they're, they're, they're highlighting the fact these studies are often extremely biased mm -hmm. and that it's very difficult to sort this out. So okay. I, don't, I don't think that invalidates any of these arguments. It's just to me, it's just like, yeah, this is landfill. Okay. This is not what we should be basing things on. And if we, yeah. if, we, if we hope for a long term study, then we just might not get this because it's going to be very, very difficult to control for these variables. And yeah, I mean, okay. there's, there's bias everywhere. Yeah. I mean, the same could be said in the United States. Got it. Okay, so Alex, Paul, and I have been chatting here back and forth a bit. I want to give you an opportunity to chime in on all this. Yeah. Um, so I think that it. I think looking at meat might be the wrong thing, especially for this discussion. Yeah. Because yeah, I mean, you know, there's intervention studies showing that introducing like lean, even lean red meat into people's diets, you know. For example, doesn't affect blood lipids. It doesn't affect common risk factors. Uh, there's a strong argument to be made about including meat for protein adequacy and nutrient adequacy, especially in like developing countries where they don't eat a lot of meat because of that poverty factor and they actually suffer things like growth stunting during childhood 
and trying to give them meat solves the issue by supplying zinc and protein and other nutrients they need to overcome those issues. Instead, I would like to, to look at plants. And I, I'm not aware of, of a single intervention or observational study that actually shows a detriment from eating more plant foods. From my knowledge, the studies show that there's either benefits or just no benefit or detriment at all. They're benign. In other words, you either have a neutral outcome or a beneficial outcome, which makes me question, you know, if we're looking at an optimal health diet, you know, uh, let's just say that meat is healthy just for the sake of argument. Like that's common ground. I think that there should be some animal product in the diet. Uh, but how much should now be plants? I think that the overwhelming data shows that the more plants you eat, the, the better the outcomes. In fact, there was just a meta-analysis published in 2020 uh, in the Journal of the American Heart Association showing that when you look at 5 million adults from 81 different studies, you know, every 200 grams of fruit, vegetable, or their combination in the diet has a uh, 3 to 15% risk reduction in developing heart disease, cancer, dying from any cause, suffering a stroke, and there's no apparent plateau. In other words, as they continue to go all the way up to like 800 grams per day, the risk, the relative risk continues to decline. Okay. And then you have all these interventions of plant heavy diets like the DASH diet, Mediterranean diet, even vegan and vegetarian diets. And you put people on these interventions and their health improves. Even the paleo diet. Every paleo diet includes a good serving of plant foods, even if it excludes grains and dairy and what else, legumes. They still include fibrous vegetables and fruits and you see health benefits. And so I, like, I'm personally curious to whether uh, Paul has come across any studies that show that adding plants into someone's diet has had a detrimental outcome. Un unrefined plants, right? Yeah, like unrefined whole plants. Okay. Um, and I'm not talking about whole grains either. I don't care about those, take them or leave them. I'm talking about like fibrous vegetables and fruits. Um, so and then before a, a similar question to the one you posed, Paul, to Joel Furman on interventional studies around meat, cons adding meat, and can you find one that shows a harmful outcome? So Alex is asking you, are you aware of any studies where they've added unrefined plant foods to the diet and shown harm? Yes. Okay. Which study? I, can yeah. You, can you explain? So this is a study from 2002, and um, they were trying to include catechins in the diet from green tea extract. And in order to do that, it's a small study, eight smokers, eight non-smokers. Uh, in order to do that, they had one of the groups go on a flavonoid-free diet. And because they wanted to study the effects of this one catechin from green tea, I, I just and, I just want to quickly point out. So the question was unrefined plants, and this is an extract of of green tea. So, I, you're, but I'll, you're, I'll you're, let you continue. You, yeah, you. Yeah, if you, I would have, if you hadn't interrupted me, I was going to tell okay. you the answer here. So there were no effects to the green tea extract intervention, and as you can see here in the conclusion, since no long term effects of green tea extract were observed, were observed the study essentially served as a fruit and vegetables depletion study. The overall effect of the 10-week period without dietary fruit and vegetables was a decrease in oxidative damage to DNA, blood proteins, plasma lipids, and concomitantly with uh, marked changes in antioxidant defense. And if you read the paper, the changes in antioxidant defense were in a positive direction. So this is one study that found, again, every group is individual. And in these people, when they eliminated flavonoid-containing fruits and vegetables for 10 weeks, they had a better, at least these surrogate outcomes looked to be better. Now, the other thing I'll say is that there are many studies that fail to show a benefit to fruit and vegetables when they are included in the human diet. So if we are looking at these interventional studies with human vegetables, there's a large meta-analysis that has been done looking at interventions. And um, people often ignore the fact that there's 
there is a large number of studies, or a moderate at least, number of studies that, that satisfy this criteria. This isn't exactly what Alex is acting, asking, but they, they, they don't improve the outcomes is what I'm saying. And so um, increasing the vegetable intake dose is associated with a rise in plasma carotenoids without modifying oxidative stress or inflammation in overweight or obese postmenopausal women. There's multiple studies like this. I'll show a few more. Um, so yeah. this one so this, this one is I, perhaps I've looked at that all of those actually. I have one, two, three, four, five. I have six studies here that all show that same thing. That adding in, you know, six hundred grams, so like a pound and a half of vegetables to the diet doesn't modify primarily markers of of oxidative stress towards DNA and things like DNA strand breaks. My issue with these studies is that when you look at the interventions, they consist mostly of using lettuce, carrots, tomato, and orange juice. And they're also looking at one very specific outcome. I have no problem saying, hey, you know, adding fruits and vegetables may not reduce the amount of DNA damage you experience. That's fine, but that's just one outcome. When, and I think that that's a narrow field of view when you look at all the things that impact health. We have to also look at things like, what about endothelial function? We have studies showing that adding in just a half pound of spinach after, for one week into someone's diet improves endothelial function by several percent. You know, and then you have other markers, um, such as visual health. I mean, we have studies that show that getting people to eat spinach because of the lutein it provides improves visual function, reduces the risk of uh, macular degeneration. Um, and then there's like some 10 studies that get people to eat blueberries and it improves cognitive function and reduces the progression of Alzheimer's disease because of the uh, anthocyanins that they're providing. Um, I think that when it comes to interventions, there's a lot of interventions that use whole plant foods and show benefits. And I think there's a lot that also don't show benefits. And I think it depends on the outcome you look at. But I haven't necessarily seen any that add plant foods into someone's diet that show harm. It's either a benefit or a neutrality. And I know that you shared a study that showed using a flavonoid depleted diet improved markers of oxidative stress. And that's interesting. And uh, I haven't read that study personally. The first question though that comes to mind is what were they, how did their diet change? Like they had to stop eating flavonoid rich fruits and vegetables, but flavonoids are just one component of polyphenols. What did they replace those with? Well, I, I, I have a broader question, which is, I mean- Well, can we, like, Ari, I'd prefer if you don't, like, please allow me to respond to Alex before you shift mm -hmm. the conversation. Oh, go ahead, Paul, yeah. Okay, thank you. So if you look at that study that I just showed yeah. Alex, um, I'll screen share it again. The, they did not use lettuce. Um, they used broccoli, which most people would say is, you know, one of the most healthy things. So the fruit and vegetable group initially 600 grams of vegetables containing apples, pears, orange juice, broccoli, carrots, onion, and canned tomato. So, I mean, you can look at these studies. Most of them include some sort of uh, vegetable that many would consider to be a quote superfood, though I would disagree with that designation. They have mm -hmm. Jerusalem artichokes and things like that. So I'm going to gently disagree with your uh, your assertion that they're including like weak vegetables because I mean I don't know what you would consider to be good for humans, but they're generally including things that most people would consider to be healthy for humans. Uh, endothelial function is very difficult to measure. I'm not sure if you're discussing something with a uh, with a you know a, a post arterial dilatation. Um, that's a really poor measure of endothelial function in general. Like we can't really use, that's just a bad measure. I think a, a bad metric to use uh, that, sort of a, that sort of a measure of endothelial function. Though I agree endothelial function is critically important and there are many compounds in meat that you can make the same argument uh, might contribute to improving endothelial function by contributing to nitric oxide production, endothelial nitric oxide synthase, precursors like arginine, et cetera. Um, you know, going on from that, I think it's important to consider that the, the lutein studies with macular degeneration are, I, I'm not totally excited about those studies. I think that, uh, I think that if you really look into macular degeneration, I've spoken to an ophthalmologist, Chris Kenobi on my podcast about this a lot, that, that it's, that 
I'm just not convinced by those studies. We can go through them individually if you'd like, but that takes us down quite a rabbit hole. I think they're they're pretty weak in their in their data that this lutein in these vegetables is magical. Now, if we pull back for one moment, I think we get to an interesting point, which is to my overarching assertion that that I don't really believe that plants have or I should say um, that plant, I do believe that plants exist on the toxicity spectrum. I haven't really talked about what I believe that to be. Um, mm. That's something I can discuss as well. But I think that when you look at plants, it's very important to consider the fact that um, I, I'm, I'm taking a position where I don't believe that many of these leaves, roots, stems, and seeds contain compounds that are unique or unique in their benefits for humans. I think that they, they may contain compounds that have biological activity in humans and also other compounds that have negative effects in humans. And so, as I mentioned earlier, the position that I take is that I think that um, you, we could get many of the benefits of eating these compounds by eating meat, which actually contains many of these compounds with perhaps less of the defense chemicals. So I think that when we're looking at these interventional studies, we get we get kind of granular and we can look at this study or that study, but it's pretty hard to ignore, and again, this goes to anecdote, the fact that many people improve when they cut these things out of their diet. And that's not a very strong position to take, but you observe it clinically over and over and over, and it's very hard. I mean, you could look at hundreds to thousands of case reports of people excluding certain plant foods in their diet and seeing improvements, whether it's oxalate nephropathy from green smoothies, um, that's case report documented, whether it's uh, other nephropathy from oxalates and chaga mushrooms, whether it's um, you know case reports about uh, elimination of plants leading to improvements in inflammatory bowel disease. So I think what we need are, are better designed studies to sort this out because there, there are, there, at the case report level, there are many examples of people improving when they cut roots, stems, seeds, and leaves out of their diet, which I think of as the most toxic parts of plants. And the corollary question then becomes, is there a downside to doing that? I don't believe there is. I think we can get anything that would be beneficial in those plants from eating meat and organs, including phytochemicals. And we can move on to the fiber discussion whenever you want, but I don't think humans need massive amounts of fiber to be healthy. So hopefully that, that helps clarify that position. The sure. blueberry studies specifically are pretty underwhelming. Um, I mean, we could look at them, but if you look at the standard deviations and the standard errors of the mean, they're 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 not impressive. <laughs> Blueberries don't cure Alzheimer's, is what I want to make a point about, and they they certainly don't cure neurologic degeneration. Um, I can pull one up if you'd like to see. I mean, some of these studies are pretty; they're just not incredibly convincing in the amount. Of, of change in people when they include these foods in their diet. I'd, um, I'd like to, to interject a couple things and, and add Ari, some Ari, uh, real quick, I, I just want to respond by that to, to kind of get back to the central point, which is that I spit out several examples. And each one of those examples Paul, you just kind of said the results were underwhelming, and that's fine. The results can be underwhelming. They were more in examples of things that show that adding plant foods into the diet have certain benefits. And I haven't yet, you know, I haven't yet had you answer the question of a study that adds plants into someone's diet and shows negative health benefits. You have shared a study that shows that markers of, oxidate, of DNA oxidative stress improve when someone limits specifically flavonoid containing fruits and vegetables. No, it was, all fruits and, it was all fruits and vegetables, really. It wasn't just flavonoid. I mean, you, we can go okay. back to that study and look at it. So well, they basically, Paul, like I said, Paul, Paul, I like just, I said, let, let, Ari, start, please let me finish. Please no, don't Alex, let me, Ari. Alex has, has been quiet. You've talked a lot, Paul. Let's give him a, a chance to fully elucidate sure. this problem. That's fine. All that's fine. Okay. So when they alleviate all, but that goes back to the other point I made, which is that we have a lot of different health markers to look at. You know, I, the same arguments could be made about meat, frankly, where you could show a study where it says, you know, Hey, adding meat into the diet doesn't seem to affect LDL cholesterol. 
like just as one example, I'm aware of a meta-analysis that shows that intervention studies, it doesn't affect one of these primary cardiovascular outcomes. But then there might be, you know, another study that then uses, um, for example, fatty meat that does show that outcome uh, when compared to something like cheese, where the milk fat globule membrane is present. And it all comes down to context and everything. But my central point is that you have like data showing interventions of using specific fruits and vegetables have certain benefits, even though the magnitude of that benefit might is variable and oftentimes weak. But where, where is the data that introducing fruits and vegetables into someone's diet or changing someone to a diet that is rich in plants, such as the Mediterranean diet or even the paleo diet, uh, that that in, has a harmful effect rather than a beneficial or neutral effect? Go ahead, Paul. So, so I think that, that that is mainly in case studies at this point, and that there, there are not studies that have been designed to look at that. So I don't think we have studies that disprove that notion, but I suspect that because of the way we have thought about plants, and I think that this is something that is difficult to debate, um, they've, they've gotten a free pass uh, over the last 70 to 100 years. The assumption has been that plants are benign and healthful. So we don't really have studies that have been designed to study that. There are no studies that have tried that and failed. There just aren't studies that are organized like that. And it would be very difficult to get funding to say, hey, we're gonna take one group and they're gonna eat an animal-based diet of meat and organs and the least toxic plant foods. And we're gonna have another group and we're gonna give them meat and organs and tons of kale. Um, and so that, that type of study has not been done. So that's a very difficult thing because I think that that's a hard thing to get funding for and a hard thing to, to get past a board or just actually get people interested in doing. Hopefully it will be done in the future. Um, I think that there are mechanistic studies that suggest potential harm from these plants. And that is generally what we look at. And uh, we couple that, or I would couple that ideologically with multiple case reports of harm or uh, chronic illnesses improving when these things are removed. Now, I think that we can use the example of, uh, you know, chronic goiter here as, a, as, a, as an illustration. There's no study that I'm aware of where people eat more cassava, but you have only to look at, um, you know, endemic goiter in Africa to people who include more cassava in their diet which is often iodine deficient because they're not eating a lot of animal foods and they have worse outcomes. Uh, similarly, I mean, they, be, they, have, they have hugely uh, hypertrophied thyroid glands and massive hypothyroidism from inadequate iodine absorption of the level of the thyroid due to the isothiocyanates in cassava. I think that exclusive studies of vegan and vegetarian diets showing profound nutrient deficiencies are not perfect, but they do show that when lots of plants are included in the diet, of course, this is in the context of the absence of meat, people run into major issues. So but I is, think that- is that you, an issue with plants or with a lack of meat? Well, it could be both. And so there's one study that I actually will point to, I can probably pull it up, in which people were given oysters and you can see the blood levels of zinc rise when they're given oysters. Mm -hmm. But if those oysters are administered with plant foods like tortillas or beans, which are high in oxalates and phytic acid, the, uh, the elevation of the zinc levels postprandially is essentially completely abrogated. So that, I think that that's a specific example of the phenomenon that I'm describing here, that plant foods are not uniquely benign for humans and that they do contain anti-nutrients and digestive enzyme inhibitors in many cases and that the inclusion of these can affect things negatively. But you bring up a good point that we do need more controlled studies. I would love to see that. It just hasn't mm -hmm. been done mechanistically. I think there's a wealth of information to suggest how this could be harmful. And there are real life examples of overconsumption of certain plants leading to major problems with humans. Cassava okay. being a great so, example with this endemic goiter. Okay. So, so Oh, hold Sorry. on one second, Alex. I want to okay. just interject a bit of context, and I'm, I'm glad we're in the crux of the debate here around plant foods being helpful or harmful. Um, one thing that I think is worth pointing out is just the concept of 
it is possible to find some study somewhere showing almost anything. So, and, and when we talk about anecdotes too, it's possible to support any way of eating based on that. You can find people who have eaten raw fruitarian diet, raw vegan diets or entirely fruitarian diets who swear it transformed their health. You can find people who ate raw meat diets. You can find people who uh, have eaten a potato diet. In fact, there's books written on the potato diet, eating nothing but potatoes for long periods of time. And you can show biomarkers showing it decreases, you know, it improves weight loss and insulin resistance and various biomarkers related to inflammation and so on. And I, I don't, and I think you guys would agree with me, that find that to be a compelling line of evidence that eating only potatoes is the ideal human diet. Um, and I think we need to, in the context of this hierarchy of evidence, be willing to also talk about what the weight of the evidence indicates. So for example, when citing studies looking at more or less vegetable consumption and oxidative stress or markers of inflammation, you could probably find one or five or 10 studies showing that it wasn't linked with improvements in oxidative stress, but there are certainly at least hundreds that have the opposite finding. So of, of interventional studies. So we have to be willing to consider a weight. What is the weight of the evidence in this discussion? But I disagree with you there, Ari. And if you are going to also uh, be a part of the debate, if it's going to be one versus two, then you must allow me time to respond to both of you. Yeah, please. I, I'm, I'm, I'm presenting what I think too, and I'm, I would love to get here. A moderator is not supposed to do that. And before the debate, it was not discussed that you would be uh, uh, showing your own opinions. So I sure. will express disappointment yeah, let, let me, that you were meant to be a you were meant to be a a moderator rather than another yeah. person. If I'm debating two people, I, that's I, fine. No, I think I think I'm doing a good job of that. Let me be clear about my bias. I don't think meat is harmful. I do think plants are helpful. I, I'm supportive of omnivory, but I also think that um, from my opinion, the the weight of the evidence and the hierarchy of evidence should be considered when asking questions of science. So. Please feel free to respond if you disagree. Uh, I, I think that uh, this is a very slippery slope. Uh, when you consider the weight of the evidence, you must consider the quality of the evidence. And that becomes a quite involved discussion. And again, I'll just reiterate that uh, uh, I'm, um, I'm, I'm happy to do that. It's just a different thing. I mean, if we're going to discuss the, the actual studies that are looking at fruit and vegetable inclusion in the human diet, we should go study by study. And we can do that if you want. I can pull up the fruit and vegetables meta-analysis looking at these studies, and we can look at these studies individually. But I think that looking at the weight of the evidence is a fool's errand. Um, and you should consider the quality of the studies as well, because sure. and, and the individual uh, the individual interventions that are done. Because just because that's, more that's studies- in the hierarchy of evidence. Uh, not, not from what you were saying. You were saying the weight of the evidence. No, the hierarchy should... of evidence specifically talks about interventional studies being higher quality, meta-analyses, and systematic reviews of randomized controlled studies being the gold standard. And that's not what I'm referring to if you are listening to me. I was saying that if we're going to compare a variety of interventional studies, we need to look at the interventional studies individually. And if that's I, I, something that we're going to do, then, that's fine. Then, then we have to do that. Because if you look at the interventional studies that are done with fruit and vegetables, then uh, we can we can do that. I mean, I'm not aware of any studies that are interventional with kale. Uh, if anyone is familiar with my work uh, or has read my book, they will know that I consider fruit to be less toxic than seeds, nuts, grains, legumes, stems, and leaves. So I'm not gonna take a huge issue with fruit inclusion studies, right, in the human diet. Um, but I, I, I am gonna take an issue, or I think that humans will do best by being aware of the fact that stems and leaves and roots and seeds um, do have defense chemicals that's very difficult to debate and that the the blanket consideration of them as universally benign for humans i think needs to be reconsidered because there these defense chemicals do appear to be harmful for some people and i don't see a reason to include these foods in the human diet when you can get many of the phytochemicals in other places or many of the benefits from meat and organs. And so if we're going to, you know, go tit for tat and look at the interventional studies with fruit and vegetables, we will need to pull up the meta-analysis with these and look at them individually. I think that it's a, it's a very um, unfortunate position to say, or to say, well, there are more studies 
looking at this and showing this finding and then to actually appreciate the quality of those individual studies and what we're actually discussing at a, at a more granular level. So, but don't, so that's but why don't, I would that's why I would disagree with you okay, um, but don't, from that don't perspective. That's a position who do, that who do systematic reviews take the quality of the the interventions no. out when they do those. No, reviews. they don't. No, no. Generally, they're not. I mean, and, and it's a little bit more of a nuanced discussion if we're talking about it now that if you look at many of these studies there, you know, we have to divide it into, and this might be an interesting discussion. I think it would be fairly esoteric for most people to listen to. But if you look at many of these studies, you know, are we going to consider studies of people who are chronically diseased, right? Are we only going to look at studies that increase the vegetable, quote unquote, but not the fruit intake of otherwise healthy humans? Because those are very different populations. It's one thing to take a diseased individual who probably has a compromised oxidative stress status, metabolic health, and, and, and include a polyphenol and say, look, in this person with underlying disease, whether it's diabetes, metabolic syndrome, many of these studies are done in people who have underlying chronic illness. We can include this food and see an improvement in the oxidative stress, okay? That's a very different situation than going and looking at healthy individuals. And that's why I think that so many of these counter studies that don't show benefit are important to consider that if you're, many of them are done in healthy individuals and there's no real benefit to including these plants in the diet. Now, we have to appreciate, and this is to Alex's earlier point, that in most of these studies, they're only looking at oxidative stress markers, DNA double strand breaks, things like this. They're not looking at other markers that might give us an indication of how these vegetables, specifically roots, stems, leaves, and seeds could be harmful for them. They're not looking at overall micronutrient status. They're not looking at thyroid status. They're not looking at overall iodine incorporation into the thyroid, for instance. They're not looking at male hormones. Many of the compounds in these foods could act as xenoestrogens. So the problem is that these studies are built to look at certain metrics. And if we're not looking, and of course, nobody's going to do a perfect study, but if we're not looking at metrics where there could be harm, you know, again, we don't know what's going on there. And mechanistically, there are studies to suggest that these plant foods, because they are defended, because of their position within ecosystems, could be harming humans. And then the follow-up question that I continue to ask is, why would we include them in the human diet if we can get all of the benefits and more by selecting more, um, more ideal foods for humans? Okay, Alex, go. Uh, okay, so for a point of clarification, because you brought up fruit, um, and given what you're bringing up as the harmful, I guess we could call them anti-nutrients, uh, is their common nomenclature. Uh, would you say that phytochemicals are beneficial or harmful or benign just in general? Um, like for example, fruit, you know, blueberries provide anthocyanins. Would you say that those have a net benefit? Like you could, you know, or mango provides mangosteen you know, apple provides, uh, or solic acid, like, would you say that these things are either benign, AKA they don't hurt us or beneficial for humans and that you would be okay with their consumption because they are present in fruit? Um, I think that you would have to look at the literature for each of those and kind of to go down the rabbit holes. Uh, Ari and I had a conversation offline when we were in Nosara about anthocyanidins and I, I need to review the literature on that. The last time I looked, I wasn't particularly impressed by, by the benefits of that family of compounds. Um, but I do think, like philosophically, what I can imagine, and I think that sometimes with nutritional science, we have to make these hypotheses because it's difficult to study, that humans certainly would have consumed this and we would have sought it out. It's brightly colored, it's on trees. And so my suspicion, or at least my hypothesis, would be that some of these phytochemicals found in fruit may be benign, or maybe we've evolved more of a position to be able to detoxify them or to deal with them, because I think that we would have had more consumption of them evolutionarily. Of course, this is just my conjecture and my own opinion that people could disagree with, and it's difficult to support it scientifically, other than ethnography or paleoanthropology. Um, but there are mechanistic explanations there. But without going down the rabbit hole of every single compound that you mentioned, I couldn't say. I know that anecdotally, when I eat mangoes, I get an allergic reaction in my mouth, probably from the urshiol in the skin of the mango. And so I don't eat mangoes, even though I'm in Costa Rica. Like, I don't believe that a mango is going to 
contribute to good health for me personally because clearly I when, I when I was with you well, two weeks ago, so you were eating you, mango. Yeah, and I had uh, a reaction on my lips oh, okay. from that. Got yeah, it. yeah. So, so I think that it's very individual, and that fruit doesn't seem to do well with me. I would imagine if the oils are irritating my lips, that perhaps they're irritating my digestive tract or causing other issues. So that's a fruit that I don't personally include. As I said from the beginning, I think there's a lot of individuality and it's important to mm -hmm. consider that, that these plants um, may not always work well for every human. Um, so I'm willing to consider that, that there are compounds in fruit that may be benign or that may be dealt with by humans. Um, maybe some of them are even beneficial for humans. And I'm most interested sort of in the, the more toxic parts of plants. Okay. As I mentioned, which is just, again, it's a construct that I've, you know, that I would imagine based on the way plants exist within an ecosystem. Um, so, uh, but as I mentioned, one of the things to also consider, and this is something that I saw recently that I thought was quite fascinating, and I'll show the paper briefly, um, is the fact that, that there are, and there, there certainly are, plant compounds that end up in meat and organs. And so this is another wrinkle in the story. And I think that um, it's quite fascinating to imagine that, um, that animals may take in plants and detoxify some things and then place other things in their meat. And so um, I think that from my perspective, when I see this, I think, well, here is more evidence that plants may not be such an indispensable part of the diet. And if these compounds are health promoting uh, or even benign, we can even get exposure to them when eating meat and organs. And I see this as a much more, uh, or as a, as a safer way to get these compounds than eating them in the plant food source that may have lots of other anti-nutrients in it um, in its native state, not having been processed by the animals. So you can see the studies they're reviewing here in this paper. It's a quite an interesting study by Fred Provenza and some other people. And the point of the study is just that, I'll read the title for people who are listening, health promoting phytonutrients are higher in grass fed meat and milk versus factory farmed animals. And again, just so the point is clear, I think that this is quite an interesting wrinkle to consider that maybe if we consider, if we think or we believe that these phytochemicals have unique benefit versus being um, just uh, benign in humans, there may be better ways to get them than eating them in defended plants in nature that are actually trying to survive. Maybe we and let the animals take care of them. This the is kind of an offshoot idea, but I think it's relevant. And the reason you think it's better in that context is because of the lack of other compounds in the plants? Yeah, yeah. That, that okay. It would be interesting to look at these, this meat versus with grass-fed meat versus grain-fed meat or just meat in general and see... Does sulfora fade up in meat, or is the animal going to use phase two detoxification so much that it actually removes this one chemical, and then this one ends up in meat? It's just an interesting line of thinking. Okay, Alex. Yeah. yeah. So another example of that is lutein, which is present in egg yolks, especially if the eggs are fed like marigold flowers, and it's far more bioavailable than spinach. Um, so I completely agree that we can obtain certain phytochemicals from animal foods in oftentimes. Uh, higher quantities and bioavailability than the plant foods themselves. Uh, but that also, you know, it, that would also, for us to even care about that, we would have to admit that phytochemicals have health benefits and that their inclusion in the diet would have a net benefit. And yeah, I agree with you. I think it comes down to an individual basis. Um, and obviously we're not going to go through every single one of the, you know, tens of thousands of phytochemicals that have ever been identified now. Uh, but, you know, humans have definitely evolved ways to incorporate those phytochemicals into their physiology for net benefits. Again, lutein is absolutely essential for protecting the retina from oxidative stress and blue light. Uh, it's also the primary carotenoid along with, uh, oh God, if I can remember the name, beta cryptoxanthin within the brain to prevent DHA oxidation. And we get these primarily through plants. Um, throughout evolution, yeah, we ate eggs, but they were not a dietary staple. Uh, similarly, you know, every single carotenoid that we know of, including astaxanthin, uh, beta carotene, lycopene, as well as lutein and zeaxanthin, have been shown to be 
readily incorporated into our skin to protect against UV induced DNA damage within the skin, which is proposed to be an evolutionary adaptation that took advantage of our diet in order to prevent the destruction of folate, in order to minimize the risk of skin cancer, uh, because it, they basically minimize the amount of damage our skin takes. So even though I think that, you know, uh, evolutionary arguments for what diet is ideal are biased because they're based around what we needed to survive and reproduce, not long-term health. Uh, I, I do think that using that same logic, we could make an argument that phytochemicals, or at least some phytochemicals, that uh, are, are not just beneficial for physiology, but actually necessary. Um, so but I, would like I, to, I would like to touch on anti-nutrients. I would like to touch yeah. on fiber. And uh, if you guys have any concluding thoughts on phytochemicals, feel free to jump in before we get into anti-nutrients and fiber. And then I would like you each both to give like what you feel, I guess, is the most compelling argument for why either we should lower the amount of plants in our diet or have more plants in our diet. Um, so if you have any thoughts on phytochemicals, feel free to jump in guys, and then we'll go fiber and anti-nutrients. Um, can I just respond to what you were saying, Alex? Sure. I don't know if you were finished. No, yeah, uh, go for it. Um, so I, I think that lutein is actually found in animal fat as well. I could find the paper, but I believe that lutein is found in like suet and tallow and animal fat. So to your point, um, I think that it's, it's very interesting to imagine that even when we were not eating a lot of plants evolutionarily, we might have gotten exposed to these, quote, phytochemicals. Mm -hmm. So I certainly would not take the position that these phytochemicals are uh, always bad. Um, I do think that there are clear examples of phytochemicals that can be harmful to humans. And so mm -hmm. it bears more consideration to understand why cassava in Africa is so dangerous with this isothiocyanate and yet some phytochemicals appear to have benefits for humans, even, and many of them, we will get through meat and organs, liver, fat, things like this, which is quite fascinating to me. So as I said earlier, I think that that really brings up this quite intriguing possibility that eating more meat and organs and fat might be a safer way to even get these if we consider them to be healthy. You mentioned the skin, which I want to touch on because I think it's a quite an interesting example of, of what's going on here as well. So you mentioned that many of these carotenoids end up in the skin and are beneficial. And I thought it was, it's fascinating to see that there are also compounds from plants that can end up in the skin and be harmful, like sorolins. I'm sure you're familiar with these. What are um, they called? Sorolins? Sorolins. I've never heard of that. Mm -mm. Oh, you're not? So there's, um, there's actually, sorolins are in things like celery. So this is, uh, a dermatologic journal from 1992, severe phototoxic burn from celery ingestion. Sorolins are pretty, pretty widely studied. Um, and basically this is a response saying that because this person was eating a pound of celery root, it contained 22.5 milligrams of sorolin oh. and it's <laughs> referencing, uh, but you could, that's not out of the realm of possibility. If you make a celery root, like a mashed celery root yeah. for Thanksgiving and people yeah go go ham on the celery root, but it was associated. Somebody, somebody could have that as a staple for sure. Yeah, it was associated with burns and this this yeah. compound, these sorolins, P-S-O-R-L-A, uh, sor yeah, P-S-O-R-A-L-E-N-S, um, are, they're, they're known to be photosynthesizing at least in some individuals. So it's it's tricky to sort this out and understand where these are coming from. And I think that even within this discussion, I'm thinking more and more like, maybe we would have to differentiate, like, is there a possibility that these phytochemicals coming from certain parts of the plant might be more harmful to humans than phytochemicals coming from fruit? This is just based on an evolutionary hypothesis, you know, uh, stemming from which things we may have eaten more uh, consistently over the course of our progression as humans and hominids. But I just wanted to highlight that idea about sorolins and negative, negative effects from those in excess. And that, that's pretty well documented in the literature. Yeah. Well, I, I just want to comment. I'm ple pleasantly surprised to see how much um, you, you guys are both very reasonable in responding to each other and acknowledging 
the areas of agreement. So I applaud you both for, for that and for the politeness and lack of mudslinging. Um, okay, so you guys wanna to jump to fiber or anti-nutrients first? Uh, I would rather do anti-nutrients. Uh, fiber could be, frankly, a, a, an entire discussion. And I think anti-nutrients are more central to the argument of Paul for why we should not uh, have a significant portion of our diet come from plants. Um, so I think that that would be more important to, to touch on. And I'll really let, let Paul start. There's, quite a few, there's like several anti-nutrients, so I would like if Paul were to uh, pick one basically as an example, and then we can start with that one and maybe move on to a couple more depending on time constraints. Just so we're clear, we're talking about things for, for the listeners like lectins, oxalates, phytates. Um, Goitrogens, phytoestrogens, tannins. So Paul, feel free to, I, I know you touched on this a bit earlier as far as inhibiting like zinc absorption, but feel free to give your, your overall take on these kinds of anti-nutrients. Yeah, so it is interesting to think about these. These are just, there's a variety. Some of them are polyphenolic, some of them are, are not. Isothiocyanates, for instance, are a different family of molecules than polyphenolic molecules. But when you look at them, there is a question. And as Alex said in the beginning, the, the question is, is the consideration of these over uh, overemphasized or do they actually present a problem for human health? And um, from my perspective, there, there is a significant amount of literature to suggest mechanistically how they could be harmful to humans. Like I said, there are a number of case reports. Um, I don't know if maybe we'll start, maybe we'll do isothiocyanates. Let's just do that one as an example. Um, but I, I will mention at least this paper to start, which is just a consideration of polyphenolic compounds in general. Again, isothiocyanates are not polyphenolic, but it's a chapter uh, from a book about the inhibition of digestive enzymes by polyphenolic compounds. Specifically, what they're talking about here are tannins in plants. And this isn't really, I don't, I don't think we'll debate the, the veracity of this finding that um, that at least in vitro and likely in vivo, consuming high tannin diets um, leads to lower amounts of protein absorption. So they say the evidence for this is summarized and discussed in relation to the possible effect of enzyme inhibition on reduced nutritional value. And it's concluded that uh, observed reduction in protein availability found in vivo on consuming high tannin diets cannot simply be explained by the formation of dietary protein tannin complexes that the ability of polyphenolic compounds to inhibit digestive enzymes may be of greater significance than realized previously. This is just, again, it's a, it's a chapter um, with a number of references, but there is uh, evidence that polyphenolic compounds, specifically tannins, do inhibit protein digestion, um, proteinases uh, throughout the body. And many animals that are primarily herbivorous, like a moose, uh, meese, meeses, uh, obviously it's a joke, uh, chew things, uh, contain compounds in their saliva that inhibit these tannins. Rabbits are known to sort of chew their food frequently and allow the tannins to aromatize or uh, to become uh, sort of- The aerosolized. To become the aerosolized, yeah, thank you, um, from their mouths while they're eating them. So there are adaptations in herbivorous animals to these compounds and um, the, the assertion that I would make is that humans are probably not that adapted to consuming large amounts of these because of our history as primarily meat eaters evolutionarily and um, that they can be harmful to humans. Now, um, there are also examples in the literature of agriculture of um, animals being encased in small grazing areas or uh, overfeeding on certain plants and having very negative side effects or die-offs um, when their grazing lands are controlled. I've heard the author of the paper dealing with phytochemicals in beef, Fred Provenza, discuss this as well, that um, when you look at the way that animals behave in their consumption of plants, they're eating a little bit of one, a little bit of another. And if they, they seem to understand that if they overconsume these plants, they will have negative consequences. Similarly, if you administer anti-nausea agents to cows, they will overconsume these foods, not having that sort of feedback from the negative compounds in plants. Now, that specifically is probably an example of tannins or other polyphenols, but it, it's getting to the broader point that the plants do contain 
do contain defense chemicals and that even animals that are primarily herbivorous uh, need, to, uh, need to take that into account when they are consuming them. If we specifically are thinking about isothiocyanates, this is a lightning rod conversation for sure. Uh, the most well-known isothiocyanate is sulforaphane, and I've discussed frequently uh, about this one, but there are many isothiocyanates that may have the potential to be negative in humans at the level of uh, iodine absorption in the thyroid, uh, among other possible detrimental mechanisms. So this is an article uh, looking at concentrations of different isothiocyanates, specifically thiocyanate and goitrin in human plasma, um, and with an associated risk for hypothyroidism. Again, we talked about the extreme example of this in people with endemic goiter and huge necks in Africa. It's not a question of whether this occurs, it's just a question of uh, what, is the, uh, what is the sort of uh, severity of this and how effective are these compounds at blocking this. And interestingly, uh, sulforaphane wasn't the worst at this, but there were other isothiocyanates found in brassica vegetables in the study uh, at levels that would be commonly consumed that had the ability to um, considerably lessen radioiodine uptake at the level of the thyroid. So as they say here, uh, in contrast, progoitrin and uh, indolylic glucosinolates degrade to goitrin and thiocyanate respectively and may decrease thyroid hormone production. Radioiodine uptake to the thyroid is inhibited by 194 micromole of goitrin, but not 77 micromole of goitrin. Collards, Brussels sprouts, and some Russian kale contain, contain sufficient goitrin to potentially decrease iodine uptake to the thyroid. However, turnip tops, commercial broccoli, broccoli rob, and kale uh, belonging to Brassica, Brassica oleracea contain less than 10 micromole of goitrin per 100 gram serving can be considered of minimal risk. So. It's just an illustration of the fact that these compounds do exist and are pretty clearly negative uh, at the level of thyroid absorption, of uh, radioactive or at least iodine absorption for the thyroid. So that's just one example of isothiocyanates. Now, the, you know, people will argue on the other side that these compounds have benefit, and I don't know where we want to take this conversation, because of their effect in the liver on the NRF2 system. And my response to that has always been that um, I think that there's pretty good evidence or at least a compelling argument to be made that we don't need compounds like isothiocyanates, be it goitrin or sulforaphane, to obtain optimal antioxidant status when we have other things in our diet that may be activating the NRF2 system, that being exercise, fasting, um, even heterocyclic amines from the consumption of meat may do this. Uh, many things in our diet and lifestyle may trigger uh, the overall production of um, glutathione containing or, or manufacturing compounds, precursors, et cetera. So um, that's my overarching perspective on those, and I'm happy to clarify, or I'll just no, allow Alex think, to respond. I think that was very thorough. Thanks, Paul. Alex, you want to go? Yeah. Um... I guess I, I have two questions, and one of them is, is a slight tangent, uh, which is that, Paul, do you think that consuming meat causes colon cancer? No. Why? Briefly, um, if, you, if possible. I think that you could take, I, I think about that from a number of perspectives, both evolutionary, mechanistically, um, epidemiologically, if you compare Asian studies. So yeah, there's a lot of, there's a lot of evidence okay. in my opinion that there is. Well, there's no let's problem. ignore observational evidence because you made that clear that that's not reliable. Let's <laughs> ignore evolution because that's not dealing with long-term health. That's dealing with survival and reproduction. Let's focus on mechanisms. Uh, red meat is classified as a probable carcinogen and processed meat is a carcinogen uh, by the World Health Organization and um, the International Association for Research on Cancer, the IARC, uh, based primarily on established mechanisms that show how meat and the compounds it contains cause cancer in colon cells. So. If that mechanistic evidence exists, why do you not believe that the inclusion of meat is problematic because it, there's a mechanistic 
possibility or there's a mechanistic route through which it causes colon cancer. So I'll show this study, which I think is probably the best summary of this that I've read. So it's a review paper. The title is Red Meat and Colon Cancer, a review of mechanistic evidence for heme in the context of risk assessment methodology. And if you look at this paper, what they elaborate on is that um, the working group cited mechanistic evidence for multiple meat components, including those formed from meat processing, such as N-nitroso compounds, abbreviated as NOC, heterocyclic aromatic amines, and endogenous heme iron. And in this paper, they make a great case for the fact that um, many of these, though there are uh, hypothetical mechanisms, again, have been studied very poorly. Animal studies utilized models that tested promotion of pre-neoplastic conditions utilizing diets low in calcium, high in fat, combined with exaggerations of heme exposure that in many instances represent intakes that were orders of magnitude, 10 to 100x above normal dietary consumption of red meat. Finally, clinical evidence suggests that the type of N-nitroso compounds found after ingestion of red meat in humans consists mainly of nitrosyl iron, and nitrosyl thiols, products that have profoundly different chemistries from certain N nitroso species, which have been shown to be tumorigenic through the formation of DNA adducts. So I think that in response to your question, I would say that many of the mechanisms proposed for any of the compounds in meat being tumorigenic, carcinogenic, um, are, are something that needs to be considered more carefully because there's certainly a large amount of evidence that, um, that it doesn't hold up to intense scrutiny, which makes a lot of sense evolutionarily, different types of endotrosyl compounds, heme iron being studied in animal models, which are calcium deficient, orders of magnitude higher, et cetera, okay, so et cetera, et cetera. The context around like they, they had a really crappy diet, you know, they were deficient in calcium, et cetera. How is this criticism of the red meat cancer any different from you saying that these goitrogens are problematic in societies that have inadequate iodine intake or, you know, under certain circumstances where they're consuming incredibly excessive amounts of these goitrogens in their diet or in animal models that use isolated goitrogens to show that it has a negative effect on thyroid. Because to uh, me, it seems like you're, you're applying a double standard to one set of evidence and you're not applying that same standard to the other set of evidence because I don't think that there is, uh, and correct me if I'm wrong here, but like, for example, if you look at soy, soy has goitrogens in it. Um, and when you look at studies that assess actual thyroid function in people that consume large amounts of soy, you find that thyroid function remains unaffected. In fact, the longest randomized control trial that we had, which uh, followed 403 menopausal women for two years, reported that consuming 120 milligrams of soy isoflavoins daily over that two-year period uh, had no significant effect on thyroid function other than a trend for a reduction in T4. And that reduction was from 1.2 to 1.1, which isn't clinically significant by any extent. So why, why are you focusing on these mechanisms that oftentimes happen under unrealistic circumstances as opposed to hard outcome data that looks at things like actual thyroid function when eating what would be considered the upper end of reasonable quantities of these foods? Um, I think that that study that I showed illustrated pretty clearly that within the realm of normal consumption of those species of brassicates, there were compounds, specifically goitrin, that pretty clearly affected radioiodine uptake. I agree. And it did. Be, it affected be... uptake, but it didn't affect thyroid function, did it? Was that assessed? Because iodine uptake and actual thyroid function, like the secretion of T4 and transformation to T3, are two totally separate outcomes. And right. iodine and uptake is also affected by how much iodine you have in your diet. It could inhibit uptake, but if you have enough iodine to compensate, that seems to be a non-issue. And so my point is that there are many plants that contain chemicals mm -hmm. that are clearly intended to have negative effects on animal human physiology, whether it's cassava or goitrogenic compounds in brassica vegetables. And the question is, why would we eat those vegetables? Why would we even negatively affect thyroid function or any of the other potential issues with isothiocyanates when we could 
get all of the nutrients from those things from other foods like animal foods, animal meat, animal organs, etc. They seem to have a clear, there's a clear indication of the plant's intention here. And the intention is sinister. And there are plenty of good mechanistic studies as opposed to the poorly done mechanistic studies with red meat and cancer or n nitroso compounds or heme iron that suggests that this is a this is a mechanism that is damaging for humans so that we must ask the question why would we include these things in our diet and to me this is a really really important conversation because there are literally hundreds of thousands if not millions hundreds of millions of people suffering with issues that are not resolved um, by Western medicine. And we must ask these questions about whether all of these plants in their diets are completely benign. And anecdotally, clinically, I see this over and over and over, that people get better, whether it's from a hypothyroid state, whether it's from a GI issue state, inflammatory bowel disease, uh, even irritable bowel syndrome, when many of these brassica vegetables or other vegetables are removed from their diet. And so I think that it's just beginning to ask the question about whether these plants are uniquely benign for humans, because your position would be, these plants are not harming you. And I will tell you with complete certainty, Alex, that if you tell people that none of these plants are harming them, there are people who will not improve their quality of life because they will not consider this to be a possible negative influence on their health. There are people that will continue to suffer we must consider the fact that the intention of these plants is clear. These are negative compounds in our health. And are they going to affect everyone's health negatively? No, certainly not. There are some people who may have enough iodine in their diet to be fine with it. But why would we eat plants, especially the most toxic defended parts of plants, that are not really improving our health as humans? This is the question I'm asking. And I think that we have to be very careful to not, to not ignore to not forsake the people who are continuing to suffer. We have to keep asking these questions. If someone is eating a diet containing kale or spinach, or collard greens, and they're thriving, who am I to tell them why to change, to, how to change their diet? I would never do that. But I think these discussions remain critically important for the people that are not well, that continue to suffer. And I just, I see it over and over and over that mechanistically, biochemically, there are so many of these defense chemicals, and that's what I'm illustrating with that paper, that are, that are not intended to be good for humans and that appear to have very negative effects for us. Do you think instead of not being intended to be good for us, maybe that their effects are more accidental? And the reason I say that is, again, if we go back to red and processed meats, there are compounds in there. And even though you say that that mechanistic data is of low quality, but other mechanistic data using similar conditions is not, which I, I don't understand, but, you know, whatever. Uh, a lot of the stuff's accidental, but why eat red meat? We can get all the nutrients we need in red meat from, for example, seafood and poultry. Uh, I disagree so with why that. eat red meat and why, why risk, you know, consuming these nutrients that have a mechanistically plausible way of hurting us? So I, I get uh, multiple questions there that I'll, I'll answer in turn, but um, I think that there, I would disagree with you. There are many nutrients in red meat and organs that are not found in fish, that are not found in chicken. And whether these be peptides that are unique to red meat, things like splenopentin or tuftsin or hepatic growth factor or BPC-157, like you, you, it is simply an inaccurate statement to say that we can get everything that is found in red meat or ruminants in chicken or fish. And I think it's an actual, it's a splitting of hairs. I have no problem with people eating chicken and fish as long as the fish is not high in heavy metals, which it usually is. Uh, not a huge advocate for clear seafood consumption. But I think that if you look at the amounts of many nutrients, especially nutrients that we're only now beginning to learn about, they're, they're not always evenly distributed and there are unique benefits to larger animals, specifically ruminants. So that would be my answer to you. Um, I, we can certainly discuss offline why the mechanistic studies with red meat are, are not accurate. I, I thought I discussed that clearly. Um, I'm not sure what part of that you're not understanding. 
Um, I think he's more using it as an as a way of arguing rather than actually disagreeing, like trying to argue that they're harmful. He agrees. With I, that. I'm just using it to draw a parallel because a lot of the things you mentioned, you know, low calcium intake, unrealistically high doses, those are the same conditions that are used with a lot of the mechanistic goitrogen studies. But and not the one that I showed. No, but the one that you showed just looked at iodine uptake. It didn't look at actual thyroid function. And it's clearly an indication that these, it's just the, the, but the, I, the intention. But I, I shared, I, like, I can, I can pull it up if you want, but I, I have a meta-analysis and the longest RCT that's been conducted showing thyroid function remains essentially unaffected. That's a hard outcome that we care about. Iodine uptake isn't. Like I said, if, if someone is eating these foods and has normal thyroid function and feels great, eat them. I have no problem with that. Okay. But in people who are suffering, the, the intention of plants is very clear here. And you said, you used the word accidental, and I wanna really clarify that. There's no accident here. Uh, in the case of sulforaphane, the precursor molecule is glucoraphanin. And so I often ask people, and I'll ask you guys this, do you know how much sulforaphane is in a broccoli seed? Um, a lot. Do you have any idea? I think broccoli sprouts are like 1,000 milligrams per gram or something like that. So the answer like is zero. It's zero until a seed rather than a sprout. Uh, no, it's zero until the sprouts are chewed. Right. It's zero until the seeds are chewed. The intention of plants is very clear here. Like there is no sulforaphane in a broccoli seed until you chew it. And the reason it is made when you chew it is because myrosinase combines with glucoraphanin. Those are separated in terms of cellular compartments. So it is the mastication, it is the chewing of the broccoli sprout seed plant that makes sulforaphane and other isothionates. It's the same thing with cassava and allyl isothiocyanate and hydrocyanic acid. These are defense mechanisms. These are booby traps that are sprung when different cellular compartments in the plant are combined via mastication. The intention of the plant is quite clear here. The plants are now, and I've often heard it said that sulforaphane, many of these isothiocyanates are so reactive from an oxidative perspective that they would create oxidative stress in a broccoli plant. So they're not used, they're not, it's not a molecule that's in a broccoli plant. And we know this in humans. That's the reason sulforaphane triggers the NRF2 keep one system is because it is an oxidative, it is a reactive oxidative molecule. There's no question about that. And so a broccoli plant doesn't contain sulforaphane until it is consumed by an animal. And so it's no accident. Um, and I, I hope I'm understanding your position properly here, but these compounds are not accidental. These are compounds that the plants are actively using as booby traps to prevent or dissuade consumption. There's no question that plants contain anti-nutrients and defense chemicals. The only question is how well adapted any individual is to eating these compounds. And certainly there are systems in our body to deal with them, phase one and phase two detoxification in the liver, but there's inter-individual variation in terms of how we do this. And I think for some people, they are pretty problematic. And the corollary assertion that I've made throughout this is that I don't see a benefit to excluding them from the diet. It seems like a much safer proposition that is evolutionarily consistent to me. Does that sort of, I mean, I just wanted to respond to those Yeah, points. that no, makes sense no, to me. There's and no I accident would agree. here. I would agree. Uh, plant secondary metabolites are defense mechanisms. Um, I guess when I said accidental, I was thinking specifically of human consumption. But in the grander scheme of things, I completely agree with you that most phytochemicals are produced as a means of like either promoting consumption or trying to circumvent it, uh, you know, depending on like what part of the plant. Um, and I also agree with you that I think there in the individual does need to be respected. Um, and that some people might do better limiting certain foods depending on their individual physiology and biochemistry, right? Uh, but I, I don't want to get I don't want to get caught in the weeds of that individuality because we both agree on it. We both agree there's always going to be exceptions to the rule. But I want to focus on the rule. Because yeah, some people should, you know, minimize their intake of high goitrogen containing foods, just like, you know, some people need to minimize their intake maybe of phytoestrogens if they have an estrogen sensitive breast cancer or, you know, some individual, yeah, there's a lot of examples of it, but you get my point. Certain individuals need different things. Some people 
might need to exclude all plants to really feel amazing if they have inflammatory bowel disease because the flares are just killing them. You know, um, but as a general rule of thumb, if we were to give like population level guidelines for how uh, the optimal diet should be built, that's what I want to focus on. And I would not say that you know, the glucophorophin or glucosinolate in broccoli that acts as a goitrogen is problematic for people, especially because, you know, over half of it's reduced by simply boiling the broccoli for five minutes. Um, and that's the case with a lot of anti-nutrients is that cooking, if we get into others, you know, most of them like lectins, uh, cooking destroys a lot of them, which reduces you know their activity now a lot of people eat plants raw that could be even more problematic than cooked plants and i agree and that gets back to the individuality thing but from our conversation on on goitrogens you know i i i yes i agree that they they are problematic in certain contexts i disagree that the evidence supports a widespread problem of including more goitrogen rich foods in the diet because i haven't I haven't seen and you haven't shared any data that shows that it actually has a negative effect on thyroid function outside of very specific circumstances such as insufficient iodine intake, consumption of maybe excessive amounts in that circumstance. It's been a lot of mechanistic reasoning that is logical, it makes sense, but it doesn't play out in the grand scheme of things because there's a lot of other factors that come into play in our biology. And I mean, iodine intake's one of those. I have a devil's advocate question for both of you. Paul, are you okay with me asking you a devil's advocate question? Uh, can I just respond to that? Sure. Yeah, yeah. This is, yeah. I'm just, so trying, I, to, I, just I, trying to ask a question here and there. But go ahead. Yeah, yeah, no, no, I think I, think, uh, I think I agree with you, Alex. I think that it's just important to consider that when we're designing an optimal diet for humans, we need to have this consideration of plants as on a toxicity spectrum. And for me, the question remains, why would we include these foods in our diet? Uh, why would we include, and again, we're, we're, we're getting to the point, I think we may have to do a part two or something for this discussion, because I think that nobody listens beyond this point. I wanted to keep it a little more succinct than this. Yeah. But I think that the question that becomes like, why would we include kale? Why would we include brassica vegetables in the diet? Um, if, if they don't have a unique benefit and there's a potential mechanistically for harm. And if we are going to design an optimal ideal diet for humans within those guidelines, we must have the caveat that, hey, many people feel better when they remove these foods from their diet. Many people feel better when they get these things out of their diet. There are plenty of instances of these things triggering people in very negative ways. There's mechanistic science behind it. There's interventional studies that are, again, with radioiodine uptake rather than end thyroid outcomes, suggesting the intention of plants as a defense chemical. And so what I fear is that when we try and create a diet for everyone, we, we're making broad strokes that are, that are often much too broad and that don't serve individuals. And so how do we create then um, an idea of a framework of a diet for humans that also includes a very clear message that the exclusion of many of these foods, specifically what I might consider to be the most toxic plants, can be very helpful for people who are continuing to suffer. And I think that's what gets left out of these broad strokes conversations about human health. I think that if the majority of people in the United States and the world ate a paleolithic type diet with organs and meat and animal fat and vegetables, human health would improve massively, right? Okay. It's like you said in the beginning that if, if people ate an animal-based diet or a carnivore diet, I think the human health would improve massively as well. But I think in either of those contexts, we have to have the discussion, and this is what I believe has been left out, right? And maybe the importance of this conversation. We must have the asterisk. We must have the consideration of the fact that these plants do not serve all humans very well. And that's a very, that's a statement that gets left out often because people will say, Look at this data, look at this observational data. Um, these are clearly beneficial for humans. And I feel like the, one of the unique aspects of, of the position that I'm taking here is to say, hey, this is not great for everyone. Like I've said throughout this discussion, if somebody's thriving, doing well, don't change your diet. 
But I want people to know when they are suffering that these things are not uniquely beneficial for humans and this is why. Because this is where the plants are coming from and these compounds are clearly intended to be negative for us. So I'll let you respond to that if you want or I'm happy to answer your question, Ari. It would be a brief response, Ari, 30 seconds. Go for it. Okay, yeah, I guess in my head though, when you mention that there are certain chemicals like bioactive peptides in uh, in animal foods that we can't get in plants, um, I would make that I would make the analogous argument that a lot of the phytochemicals in plants we can't get in animal foods, even though we could get some, no doubt, we can't get you know the majority, and that even though the majority might have weak evidence behind them, I think you would also have to concede that a lot of these you know up and coming bioactive peptides. Uh, would also have equivalently weak evidence, uh, possibly even weaker. Um, so, I, you know, it, it comes back to something you brought up earlier, which is that we need better data. And that's something I wholeheartedly agree with. Um, while I don't think that like this type of thing would be done ever, you know, it would be cool to start seeing some studies that actually look at primarily carnivorous diets and compare them to equivalently quality diets that were richer in plant foods because that would answer a lot of questions you know that would really help isolate all of these phytochemicals without the without the unrealistic scenario of looking at them in isolated like high dose concentrations uh, I, I that actually makes me think of a, a, qu a question that i have for both of you um and i, I don't know if you were saying this but there are we didn't really talk about this earlier in, in this detail but there, I don't think would, there are clearly compounds in animal foods that you cannot get in, in plant foods. B12, creatine, carnitine, choline, answerine, taurine, vitamin K2, like there's really not a lot of riboflavin in plant foods. Like there's, there's, this is really not even a topic for discussion to understand that there are many unique things that are necessary for optimal human health in animal foods. Now, I think that it's, it's much more difficult to make the corresponding argument, though, your point is well taken that we would have to consider, you know, are these phytochemicals really valuable for humans? And do we really know which of them show up in animal foods and which of them don't? The paper that I showed might suggest that, you know, maybe, maybe the ones that are beneficial for humans, I mean, a significant amount of them might actually show up in, in animal foods. And so I think that that would be a something, a topic for further discussion. Ask the um, an example of that as well, showing up in, in salmon and shrimp and salmon eggs. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. And no, I, 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 there's really no plant sources of that as well. Other, I mean, unless you go seek out that algae, which I'm not aware of any uh, human society that, that does that. No, the closest I could think of would be spirulina, but that's technically not an algae. Um, yeah. It's a cyanobacteria and uh, the natives off of Lake Chad in Africa and Lake Tanzania in Central America have that as a staple of their diet. Uh, interestingly enough, it's also a uh, bioavailable source of vitamin B12 that, that is usable by humans um, in quantities that could satisfy B12 requirements. Although no study I'm aware of has actually looked at if it could prevent a deficiency because that would take a really long time. Uh, but it contains the cobalamin molecule. Interesting. Seems like okay. it'd be much easier just to eat animal foods. But. Do you guys want to do um, Oh, I agree. I agree. Do you guys um, want to I, fiber or we got to end? I think we should wrap it up. I mean, yeah. we can do fiber. It just gets I to I think fiber would be a Sorry. cool one to, to do if in like a follow-up. Um, okay. So we'll, we'll, well Can I ask that. you guys a question? Go for it. Have either of you ever done a carnivore diet or an animal-based type diet? Uh, animal-based, yeah, certainly. Um, not not for well, well, animal, like to the exclusion of plants. Yeah, yeah. So, and by animal based, I mean the, the way that I've talked about it, with the exclusion of nuts, seeds, grains, legumes, leafy greens, stems, yeah. and roots. And have you done that, Ari? Just yeah. meat and fruit and organs? Not no. When I was doing when I was doing heavy meat, it was more of a, an extreme low carb keto approach. So not no mm. fruit, no fruit and honey. Were you including any organs in your diet? Yeah. You were? Yeah, liver and heart. Okay, cool. What about you, Alex? Yeah, um, what year? I don't know. This might have been back in 2014, I think. My diet was based around uh, 
meat like chicken and bison and chicken hearts and beef liver and eggs and cheese and then the primary plants in my diet were potatoes for starch uh, a big salad at lunch and um, coconut why do you ask okay i'm just curious you know because i think that um personal experience is valuable and um you know i have my own story of basically eating a paleolithic diet having pretty bad eczema and then excluding the majority of plant foods and having that improve. And I wasn't sure if either of you had experimented with something like that to see I've, how I've, your body reacted. I've done probably every, every extreme diet than you can imagine in my teens and twenties. But, um, yeah, I, I agree completely with what you said. I've done vegan. I've even done raw vegan for a period of time. I can't say those experiments ended well at all. Um, but my low carb keto, heavy animal food diets also didn't didn't end great, um, especially just as an athlete, like notable decrements in performance for sure. Um, other than that, I can't say I noticed much of an effect. But um, Alex, do you want to chime in with your experiences? Um, I, I come from a the whole reason I got into nutrition was because I did a decade of competitive wrestling that gave me an eating disorder. And so I've always just been able to push my way through any diet I've been on with willpower. And uh, I probably feel best where I'm at now, which is just a mix of plants for starches, uh, probably less fibrous vegetables than I've eaten historically. Um, and then continue to eat meat, high quality, lean meats. Uh, so most of my fat comes from plant sources, most all of my fiber from plants. Um, and then resistant starches from cooked and cooled starches, but meat makes up provides, you know, half my nutrients and all of my protein. And I will say, Ari, that uh, a lot of people experience that on ketogenic or low carb diets. And that's one of the reasons that I reincorporated carbohydrates in my diet yeah. um, from from sources that seem to work work for me is that, um, yeah, that, that I, they're, they're, that's why I think that there should be consideration of those macronutrients a little bit. Yeah. And I applaud you for not being so dogmatic in that kind of belief system, especially being an author of a book on that subject. It's, I think, easy to lock ourselves into our belief system where we become inflexible and unable to adapt. I know I've been there, you know, many times with different extreme diets where I've been so convinced of that diet being the ultimate truth that like I'm I mean, it basically created an, an eating disorder as far as inflexibility of being willing to deviate from that. Um, so if you guys are cool with it, I'd like to ask one sort of devil's advocate question to wrap up. Sure. I'll just mention in response to your statement, Ari, that uh, yeah. as I said in the beginning, that there, there, even when I wrote the book, I don't think it was dogmatic or okay. um, extreme. There were, there were considerations that, that allowed for some flexibility. So cool. I just want to make that very clear because yeah. you, 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 you seem to kind of continually try and paint me differently. I, I, okay. I, I'm always happy to give you the opportunity to clarify, but apologies if you feel I'm misrepresenting. Um, so Alex, I would like to ask you if, and, and to this point, Paul, if you feel I'm misrepresenting things, please correct. Um, I would like to ask you, Alex, if you think it's possible that, you know, kind of this whole body of nutritional epidemiology for the last 70 years and the thousands of studies on that that have kind of pointed towards plant-based diets being the key to health. And I, I would say if there's one point of agreement that historically everybody on the different, you know, dietary spectrum has agreed upon, it's that vegetables are healthy. And in this podcast, that's been debated. So do you think it's possible that kind of mainstream thinking around nutrition for many, many decades, just we, we could have gotten that badly wrong and all of that, the studies that have pointed in that direction could be flawed? I think it's possible that eating a diet with little to no plant food could be healthy. Um, I don't think we have data to support that. And I think what data we do have looking at meat heavy da uh, diets is heavily confounded by unhealthy user bias and also by the types of meats being consumed. 
However, I would hypothesize based on what evidence we do have available uh, that a diet, a meat heavy diet that perhaps reduced its meat and made and replaced much of it with plant foods, uh, specifically, not just any plant foods, but specifically replaced it with fruits, fibrous vegetables, and legumes would be probably uh, much healthier. And that will get into a, hopefully, a follow-up discussion we have about fiber. But I also do think that uh, the, uh, there isn't sufficient data to support a detriment of anti-nutrients such as lectins, phytates, goitrogens, or phytoestrogens in certain plant foods uh, when it comes to actual hard outcomes in humans, uh, even if there is mechanistic plausibility. Um, and especially under the context of a nutrient-sufficient diet. So I think there's more possibility that a plant-heavy diet is detrimental under conditions of, for example, poor socioeconomic status or developing countries where they're not getting a lot of these bioavailable nutrients that are supplied by animal foods. And therefore, these anti-nutrients wreak even greater uh, havoc. And you know, you, we go back to that goitrogen example, low iodine intake with high intake of goitrogenic foods, bad case of goiter. But I think under nutrient adequacy, supplied by a combination of plant and animal foods, I don't think that these anti-nutrients, I don't think they are detrimental to our health. And I think that there is a good body of evidence supporting the beneficial effects, even if we haven't figured out every single mechanistic reason why, of a lot of these uh, secondary plant metabolites that go outside of just the vitamins and minerals that they provide. Just like I think that there's a lot of benefits from certain zoo nutrients that are present in animal products, things you can't get in plants like, you know, carnitine, creatine, taurine. You know, I think a lot of uh, these bioactive peptides, bioactive amines, that type of thing also have benefits uh, and we can't get those from plants. Mm -hmm. Excellent. Paul, um, my question to you is if plants are, correct me if I'm misrepresenting, if plants are, let's say, a net negative, is that agreeable? Or in the majority of people that high plant food consumption is net harmful rather than net positive? What, what's, your, what's your question, Ari? I, 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 I don't understand why that you're... Way, that's, that's okay. Um, okay, well, so, we'll see. Yeah. Okay, so if, if that is the case, how could so many studies, epidemiological, flawed as they may be, healthy user bias incorporated, but given that many of these studies can tr try to control as much as possible mm -hmm. for a lot of those confounding variables like smoking and exercise habits, um, how could so many point in that direction and how could there be so many anecdotes of, let's say, vegan, and remember, I'm not a vegan or an advocate of veganism, but how could there be so many vegans who go entirely plant-based where their whole diet is composed of things that you're saying have sinister intentions and yet report such positive health effects and reversal of diseases and, and so on? I believe you're asking me multiple questions. Um, I will, I'll, I'll answer the vegan one first. And I think that again, the devil's in the details. And um, this is the problem with considering the weight of the evidence, but in, if you look at these instances, and again, we don't have specific vegans here to ask about the improvements in their health, but I think it's pretty clear that, um, that, you, that, that the main offender, as we said from the beginning, is, is processed sugar and seed oils and the processing of foods. And so despite the inclusion of anti-nutrients in their diet, moving from a diet containing more toxic things to a diet containing relatively less toxic things could lead to health improvements. Now, interestingly, as I touched on earlier, um, if you look at long-term vegan nutrient adequacy, it's abysmal. And I think that that is an indication of lower bioavailability and overall con content or overall presence of anti-nutrients or at least uh, digestive enzyme inhibitors, things that block absorption of nutrients on an entirely plant-based diet. So. Um, to, you know, to bring, to bring good old Joel back into this conversation, 
Um, Long-term vegan diets are a nutritional nightmare for humans without massive amounts of supplementation because plant foods simply do not contain uh, adequate nutrition for human beings. That is very difficult to argue. I feel very strongly about that. So though people may improve in the short term, they ultimately have a, uh, a flaming, uh, just a flaming crash of the airplane later on when, when they run into all sorts of health problems with these diets. So um, you could improve with fasting, right? You could eat no food and see an improvement. And you mentioned this earlier with regard to the potato diet and other diets. And it's, it's really important to consider that many of the studies with vegan and vegetarian diets are calorie restricted, as, are, as was the Twinkie diet, as are these potato diets, because you simply cannot eat enough calories from potatoes. So anyone with metabolic dysfunction is going to see an improvement in their overall uh, health and insulin sensitivity when they have calorie restricted diets. And even if those calorie restricted diets are composed of some of the least uh, bioavailable nutrients or foods that are what, in what I would consider to be less optimal for humans, they're, they're going to see an improvement, at least in the short term. But I think long term studies bear out the fact that there are problems with these foods, uh, both in the absolute amount and bioavailability of nutrients. And I would suggest from the perspective of the fact that many of these nutrients are much harder to absorb or these anti-nutrients like phytic acid or oxalates, like we discussed with the zinc study, can impair the absorption of minerals from other foods that might even be animal containing. So that's the answer to your first question. The second, the, the, well, that was the second question you asked. The first question you asked, which uh, was, why do so many observational studies point to a benefit with these plants? And I think that we discussed that earlier pretty in depth, um, having to do with healthy user bias and unhealthy user bias. I'm not sure we really need to go into that in detail. Yeah, um, you and I discussed this a little bit. Second part, yeah. You and I discussed this a little bit um, in our previous uh, meeting, um, and I think that there are not um, uh, there are not good studies that have been done looking at uh, high vegetable and low vegetable populations from an observational uh, perspective, and it just doesn't exist. When we look at these studies, they're they're generally all of the people in them are eating vegetables. At, at moderate amounts. So it's, it's, it's hard to see a signal in epidemiology. And as we kind of talked about in, in this podcast, I think that this may be one of the cases where uh, we have to think about um, whether uh, we lose the individual um, and individuals continue to suffer when we consider uh, that other research um, as a primary means of making the decision. Yeah. Guys, thank you so much for all of the time. This has been a lot of fun. And thank you for also being so polite and respectful and uh, being willing to like agree when you actually agree on certain things. So um, this was awesome. Paul, thank you for being brave enough to come on after you know we met in person and had a brief scuffle. So you kind of knew we had some disagreements going, going into this. And I know you're a bit wary of kind of a two-on-one dynamic. I, I did my best to leave out most of my commentary of this. And I know you got mad at me a couple times there, but hopefully I was uh, good enough to be relatively unbiased in moderating this discussion. And um, guys, thank you so much. This, this was awesome and hopefully we can do it again. Yeah, I would like a, a follow up on fiber because I think that's just a fun topic to talk about and I really like fiber. Um, as, as a discussion topic, I think it's interesting because there's a lot we actually don't know. And so I think that, you know, it would be interesting to see what agreements me and Paul could come to on that, just like we did here. Yeah. Paul, yeah, I appreciate you guys. Uh, yeah. Thanks for coming on, Alex. I enjoyed it. I think it's fun and we should keep keep sharing ideas. I think this is what moves things forward and it's it's what we need to do more of. And I appreciate you hosting it, uh, Ari. And it's good to have a moderator, though. Um, as I said, I think it's important the moderator remains, you know. Well, trust me when I tell you there was about 500 times I wanted to interrupt you and say certain things and I restrained myself. So I, I did the best I, I could that. On, on that front, given, you know, that we're humans, we all have our own biases. So um, thank you guys again. And um, to all the listeners, uh, I guess the debate lives on. You have to decide which arguments you felt were more compelling around plant foods being helpful or harmful or benign and where you fall on that. So thank you guys again. This was a pleasure. I hope to talk to you both again in the near future. Yeah. Thanks, man. Later. See you guys.